Greetings from St Bride's Church, Fleet Street, here in the very heart of the City of London. We're delighted that you're tuning into this podcast during this season of Lent. Do please leave a comment or a like and tell us where you're listening from. It's always good to hear from you. And if you would like to donate to help support these online services, you'll find details of how to do so in the accompanying text. And now, may the light and peace of Christ be with us all as our worship begins. May I welcome you very warmly to St Bride's to our service of choral evensong on this, the third Sunday of Lent. We're delighted that you are able to join us online for this service. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all men such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, let us kneel now and humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Let us pray. Oh. 
almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant unto you pardon and remission of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh Lord, open thou our lips. and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. And it was in the beginning, it's now, and Praise ye the Lord. The Lord
The Old Testament lesson is written in the book of Genesis, chapter 28, beginning at the 10th verse. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and he put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob waked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had had put for his pillows and set up for it a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The New Testament lesson is written in the Gospel according to John, chapter 1, beginning at the 35th verse. Again, the next day after, John stood, and two of his disciples. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God! And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is, being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was born of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain, and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ.
In the name of the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. As some of you will be aware, one of the ways in which we're seeking to deepen our spiritual roots as a community of faith here at St Bride's is through reconnecting with our Celtic Christian heritage and our patron saint, St Bridget of Kildare. We're currently exploring the idea of refurbishing our main crypt chapel downstairs with the idea of dedicating it specifically to St Bride, St Bridget's memory and using it as a focus for Celtic prayer. And it is a particularly appropriate strand of Christian tradition for us to be exploring at the present time with its profound connection to the theme of God in creation. We are all, I suspect, acutely aware of just how critical our relationship with the created world truly is. And as it happens, during these past four days, the Church of England calendar has celebrated two other very famous Celtic saints. Thursday was St Patrick's Day, when we commemorated Ireland's patron saint. And today, the 20th of March, is the feast day of St Cuthbert of Lindisfarne. Cuthbert was born around the year AD 640, probably in the lowlands of Scotland. As a young boy, he experienced a profound experience of the presence of God and resolved to de dedicate his life to God's service. He was admitted as a monk to Melrose Abbey and eventually moved to Lindisfarne, where he became abbot and was consecrated a bishop in the year 685. He travelled tirelessly around his diocese, walking and preaching, but also retreating for times of solitude and prayer. A few years ago, I had a very memorable holiday in the northeast of England, during which we visited some famous sites associated with Celtic Christianity, which included a visit to Lindisfarne. It was not my first time there, but I found myself deeply affected by the experience, just as I was on my initial journey over the famous causeway to that remarkable island. There is something about the ruins of the ancient abbey, a holy site where prayer has been valid for centuries. There's something about it that leads one to experience it as a thin place, a place where the boundary between the heavenly and the earthly feels to be very fine indeed. And although we happened to be there at the height of summer, the wind was strong and the weather blustering. One felt very exposed to the elements and to the gaze of Almighty God. Those of you who have visited Lindisfarne yourselves may remember that there is a tiny island just off the main island's coast, which, like Lindisfarne itself, is cut off by the sea each day at high tide but connected when the sea is out. In other words, you can clamber over the rocks to reach it when the tide is away. Traditionally called Hobthrush, it is now better known as St Cuthbert's Island because it was there, within sight of the main island, that Cuthbert withdrew to embrace the life of a hermit. Eventually, he felt that even that isolated place was simply not remote enough for him, so he relocated to Inafarn instead, which was the place of his eventual death. On my last visit to the abbey on Lindisfarne, the tide happened to be out, so for the first time I was able to make the rather challenging journey to St Cuthbert's Island over the slippery rocks. I went there alone and I found the place extraordinary. It was profoundly moving to think that all those centuries ago, Cuthbert had knelt there in solitude, yearning for ever greater closeness to God and closeness to the elements without any of the distractions of normal human life to get in the way. The Venerable Bede described Cuthbert's time at Lindisfarne 
as follows. When Cuthbert came to the church and monastery of Lindisfarne, he handed on the monastic rule by teaching and example. Moreover, he continued his custom of frequent visits to the common people in the neighbourhood in order to rouse them up to seek and to merit the rewards of heaven. Some of the monks preferred their old way of life to the rule. He overcame these by patience and forbearance, bringing them round little by little through daily example to a better frame of mind. At chapter meetings, he was often worn down by the bitter insults, but would put an end to the arguments simply by rising and walking out calm and unruffled. Next day, he would give the same people exactly the same admonitions as though there had been no unpleasantness the previous day. In this way, he gradually won their obedience. He was wonderfully patient and unsurpassed for courage in enduring physical or mental hardship. Though overwhelmed by sorrow at these monks' recalcitrance, he managed to keep a cheerful face. It was clear to everyone that it was the Holy Spirit within giving him strength to smile at attacks from without. Such was his zeal for prayer that sometimes he would keep vigil for three or four nights at a stretch. Whether he was praying alone in some secret place or saying psalms, he always did manual work to drive away the heaviness of sleep, or else he would do the rounds of the island, kindly inquiring how everything was getting on, relieving the tedium of his long vigils and psalm singing by walking about. What I love most about that description is what a very humane man he remained within the context of his era, despite the deprivations and the challenges of the lifestyle that he chose to adopt. Cuthbert was patient and calm and zealous in prayer, never roused by the bitterness and insults of others. During Lent, just for this very short time, we are invited to taste a little of the kind of life embraced by Cuthbert. Perhaps we might seek a little solitude or respond to frustration with patience, but above all, spend some time in prayer. Amen.
Let us pray to God the Father, who has reconciled all things to himself in Christ. For peace among the nations, that God may rid the world of violence, and let peoples grow in justice and harmony. We continue to pray at this time for the peoples and leaders of the Ukraine and Russia. We pray for a laying down of arms. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. For those who serve in public office, that they may work for the common good. We pray especially for our Queen and for our government and the leaders of the nations. We pray also for journalists and especially those in harm's way. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. For Christian people everywhere, that we may joyfully proclaim and live our faith in Jesus Christ. We pray especially today for the Anglican Church in Mexico and for Enrique Cruz, its primate. Also for the church in Lund in Sweden and for Johann Tuberg, Bishop. In our own diocese, we pray for the Hackney Deanery, for Andrew Wilson, area dean, for its sub-deans, chapter clerk, and for the Deanery Synod and its staff. We pray for the leaders of all God's holy churches, and especially for Justin and Stephen, our archbishops, Sarah, our bishop, and Alison, our rector. We pray for all who serve this community of St. Bride, and we pray for those who are preparing for confirmation at this time. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. For those who suffer from hunger, sickness or loneliness, that the presence of Christ may bring them health and wholeness. Remembering especially any known to us who are in need at this time. Those in our parish community in this city and around the world. And all who suffer in body, in mind or in spirit. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have departed this life in thy faith and fear. We remember especially all the recently departed and those whose years mind comes at this time. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. May we with them come to share in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Let us commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful Father, accept, accept these, prayers these prayers for the, for the sake, sake of thy, of thy Son, Son, our, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And to the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.